In this presentation, we are going to take a look at the book of Mosiah, chapters 11 through 17. We'll take a look at some of the doctrines and principles and give some insights and commentary concerning Mosiah 11 through 17. So let's begin with Mosiah chapter 11. 11 verses 2 through 19 and 27. Noah walked after the desires of his own heart. Mormon vividly described the wickedness of King Noah. Later, Mosiah used the example of King Noah as the primary reason to eliminate governments by kings. How much iniquity doth one wicked king cause to be committed? Yea, and what great destruction? Yea, remember King Noah? That was Mosiah saying those words. King Noah's complete selfishness in seeking the desires of the flesh stands as a warning to modern readers of the fate of such individuals. It is bitter irony that the name Noah means literally rest or comfort. This particular Noah, King Noah, did not bring rest and very little comfort. In fact, he brought bondage and spiritual death. Chapter 11, verse 2, the phrase, many wives and concubines. By definition, a concubine could be either a woman kept for lewd purposes or a lawful wife of a lower social standing than her husband's other, her husband's other wives, wife or wives. Hagar, poor wife of Abraham, would be an example of the latter definition. We have no reason to suppose that there was any sort of social caste system among the Nephites that would justify the idea that Noah had taken wives of a lower social order. Along with having plural wives, King Noah and his priests also consorted with paramours, or a mistress. Their example of whoredoms and all manner of wickedness served to justify and entice their people into similar behavior. As noted earlier, such practices had been condemned by the commandment of the Lord through Father Lehi. Chapter 11, verses 3 through 4. A telling line in verse 4 is that Noah changed the affairs of the kingdom. That is, the people of Lehi and Nephi no longer walked the lighted path of goodness, but chose instead to follow the dark and crooked road. They now they were now taxed to pay for Noah to sin and would yet pay for his sins. That sounds eerie familiar to today, isn't it? That many in corrupt government that we pay taxes so that they can wallow in their sins. And then we will pay because of the sins of our leaders. You can see why Mormon included this story. This is a direct reflection of what is going on today, even in our own government in the United States. Chapter 11, verse 5, the phrase, He put down all the priests and consecrated by his father. The priests of Noah were corrupt, and their priesthood one of defilement and debauchery. Of interest, but unclear in the Book of Mormon, is what authority, if any, the priest had who were consecrated by Zenith. Assuming Zenith to have been properly ordained, it may well be that Alma traced his authority to this source. Chapter 11, verses 6 through 7, the phrase, Thus did the people labor exceedingly to support iniquity. Perhaps a modern-day lesson we can learn from this is how we vote and who we put into office of government. If we support and vote for those whose values are after the manner of the world, then we too are guilty of laboring to support iniquity, to covering our sins, gratifying our pride and vain ambitions, causing the heavens to withdraw themselves. The Spirit of the Lord is grieved, for the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness." we will be held accountable for the actions and beliefs of those we vote for to govern us. So we just can't vote and then say, oh, they're wicked people. That was their wickedness. No, if we vote in wicked people or support a party that supports wickedness, then that means by extension, we too are wicked. And we will be held accountable for that vote and the actions of those leaders. Be careful who you vote for because what you're doing is saying you agree with their agenda 
As surely as there is a God in heaven, and as surely as there will be a day of judgment, all who have held positions of leadership, and those who put them there, will be required to give an accounting for that which they did with the office or position that was theirs. Notice, not just the leader, but also those who put them there will have to give an account. Righteous government is essential to the preservation of society, and leadership is a sacred trust. All who have led others in the paths of wickedness or voted for them will be rewarded according to their works. We cannot use the excuse, well, I didn't know. I just voted for them. You're giving your sanction to whatever beliefs, ideologies, or philosophies and different things they do in government. You're giving your okay and you will also be held accountable. Chapter 11, verses 8 through 15. An earmark of false religion is an attempt to hide its emptiness in such things as pomp and ceremony, grandeur and elegance. The purpose of, great, of the great and spacious building of great and spacious buildings, ornate and decor, is to create a sense of reverence and awe that otherwise would be lacking. Gold and silver, silk and scarlets, magnificent treasures of art and craftsmanship, buildings of enormous size and expense, such are the trappings of the kingdoms of this world, and the cloak of the god of that which is worldly. See, isn't it interesting that in King Noah is said that he built all kinds of buildings, do we get caught up in the trappings of the world promised by our government leaders and then we get deceived into voting for wicked leaders whose ideologies and philosophies are actually against the gospel of Jesus Christ? Chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. No longer do we find a people who in the strength of their God seek to defend their home and their land, but rather a people who glory in bloodshed and pride themselves in their own strength. Thus, as all things produce after their own kind, wickedness begets wickedness, and a people become ripe for destruction. We live in a time, brothers and sisters, where... We have people that no longer want to defend America and the Christian values that it stands for, but would rather pride themselves in the luxuries they can get because of their office and the bloodshed they seek by the wars which they commit and support and sustain. We see that going on right now, today, in our government. We have no business in meddling in the affairs of other nations and their wars, unless it directly involves our nation, which I would maintain that what is going on now does not. But we're seeing a corrupt government and administration supporting all kinds of wars to build themselves up and to spend all kinds of money that eventually some of that comes back to these leaders. Boy, we need to be careful. Chapter 11, verse 20, the prophet Abinadi. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, highlighted Abinadi's courage and willingness to obey the Lord. Quote, Abinadi infuriated wicked King Noah with his courageous testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Eventually, this great missionary offered the ultimate sacrifice for his witness and faith, but not before his pure testimony touched one believing heart. Alma, one of King Noah's priests, repented of his sins, accepted Jesus as the Christ, and went about privately among the people and began to teach the words of Abinadi. Many were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ as a direct result of Abinadi's powerful born testimony of the Savior, believing by one soul, Alma. So even if only one soul is all that we affect, who knows how much good that one soul can do as we see Alma and what good he did for the church. While serving in the 70, Elder Cree L. Coford discussed Abendai's influence and example, quote, what is, the, what is there that is so special about Abinadi? 
Perhaps it was his total obedience as he went, presumably alone, among those whom he must have known would take his life, deliver the word of the Lord, and to cry repentance to the people. Perhaps it is the very fact that we know so little about him, or perhaps it was simply the way which, with which he faced the adversaries which came into his life in such a straightforward, square-to-the-world world way. Whenever, what, whatever the reason, Abinadi was and is special. His life lived so long ago still has the power to excite the mind and to cause the pulse to pound. End of quote. We know that Abinadi was a man who came from among the people, not from outside their society. He was obviously a righteous man called to warn his own people if they did not repent. Bondage and destruction would follow. We see that in our own nation. If our country does not repent and our government does not repent, brothers and sisters, we will see destruction and bondage follow. We see destruction and bondage already happening in the United States. Because of the sex trafficking, the pornography, the addictions, government leaders that are corrupt, you can see why the Book of Mormon is so important for our day. It's mirroring what we are going through, or we are mirroring what they went through. Chapter 11, verses 20 through 21. As righteous brings forth the blessings of heaven, so wickedness brings forth its cursings. Yet the Lord does not discipline people unless he first warns them of that which is to come, and with great patience invites them to repent. We know of no instance in which the nation of Israel or any of its remnants have been placed in bondage to their enemies that was not the result of their own wickedness and in which they were not forewarned by prophets sent specifically for that purpose. It is a well-established pattern for the Lord to chasten his people. Chasten means to learn through suffering at the hands of their enemies. Thus Israel, like the rebellious child, who refuses the love and counsel of his parents, becomes a ready prey for her enemies, and is dis disciplined and schooled by her own folly. 11 verse 22, the phrase, I am a jealous God. God's jealousy is but a manifestation of the reality that there is no proper compromise where the verities of heaven are concerned. Man cannot serve two masters. He cannot give allegiance to rival kingdoms. He cannot be both an Israelite and a Palestine, a Philistine. The jealousy of God is a manifestation of his desire to save all of his children. For our sake, he is a jealous God, meaning he wants us to worship him only because he knows that is the only sure and true path to happiness and eternal life. Chapter 11, verse 22, the phrase, they shall be brought into bondage. As disobedience brings bondage and sorrow to nations, so it does to individuals. How often we have seen and acted the story of Israel's wayward remnants repeated in the life of some young man or woman, so consumed with his own desires that he refuses the counsel of wise and loving parents, later finding himself in a position in which only that which he originally rejected can save him and then only with the greatest of difficulty. As I said, our nation is being brought under bondage because of the wickedness that is prevalent in our society. President Nelson has warned us. He has warned us about abuse that is within the church, sexual, physical, emotional, verbal, and he's told us to knock it off. Are we going to listen, or are we going to continue and continue down the road of bondage. Chapter 11, verse 24, the phrase, I will be slow to hear their cries. As DNC 101, 7 through 8 warns, quote, They were slow to hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God. Therefore the Lord their God is slow to hearken unto their prayers, to answer them in the day of their trouble. In the day of their peace they esteem lightly my counsel, but in the day of their trouble, of necessity, they feel after me. When things are going well, do we tend to forget God and we put him aside and then we end up committing error? And then we plead unto God because we're in trouble? God wants us 
to always submit to him and his will, to always remember him. If we are slow to hear the cries of God, then he will be slow to hear our cries. In other, we get what we desire. We get what we do. Chapter 11, verse 25, a sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth, which was made of goat's hair, was dark in color and coarse in texture. Traditionally, it was worn by those in mourning, and thus it became an appropriate symbol for the godly sorrow and the contrite of soul. That must be a part of true repentance. The stewing of ashes, strewing of ashes upon oneself was also a symbolic gesture representing the depth of humility and the tr truthfulness of penitence. Chapter 11, verses 26 to 29. One of the consistent evidences of the truth of a prophet's message is the anger that it kindles in the hearts of the wicked. Now that is important. The wicked get upset with what we teach in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the more they get upset, then the more true it is. Validity draws the fire, and there is no confusion among the legions of the adversary as to whom, who their opponents are. There is a power in heaven, sent truths to which the sophistry of hell has no response, but the spirit of murderous wrath. That's how we know we're on the right track in the church, if the wicked become more upset and angry with us. Chapter 11, verse 27, who is the Lord? Such is the dialogue of some of the devil's most distinguished servants. Noah's spirit and words are the same as some of the adversary's most nefarious notables, Cain and Pharaoh, who also challenged the Lord's anointed with the question, who is the Lord? The world will always challenge God, saying, Who is God? Show us if there really is a God. Chapter 11, verse 29. The phrase, The eyes of the people were blinded. Religious truths are felt. Those who refuse to see cannot feel, and cannot, in the hardness of their hearts, company with the Spirit of the Lord. Thus, that which is dark and evil seeks to find companionship with them. Let's now turn to Mosiah chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, Abinadi's warnings. The failure of the people of Noah to hearken to Abinadi's first warning led to a more serious warning when he returned two years later. The consequence became that they would be in bondage, and if they did not repent, they would be destroyed. This is often the case in life. When we put off obedience or delay following the prophet, we bring more serious consequences upon ourselves. Notice that Abinadi prophesied, because you didn't listen, I come back a second time, you will be put in bondage. Even when Limhi's people and Alma's people repent, they still go into bondage because they had missed that first opportunity. They still have to pay that penalty that price. Repenting later didn't take away their misstep of when Abinadi first came. They still have to be in bondage for that. And so that's why that's heaped upon them even after they repent. We too maybe go through some things in our lives because we're suffering the consequences of maybe some past things that we didn't repent of. But we've repented now, we're on the straight and narrow, but we still have to face the consequences of past things that maybe we did not take care of. Obedience to the voice of heaven brings freedom, while a deaf ear and a stiff neck brings bondage. The voices of heaven and the earth join to testify against sin. When the power of the prophetic word unites itself with the witness of famine, pestilence, hell, insects, and bitter winds, only to go unheeded, bondage and destruction are inevitable. So it ever has been, so it will ever be. The wicked and the rebellious are bound with chains of their own forging. The legions of hell know no freedom. The course of servitude is the same for nations and individuals alike. As communities, 
as community sins bring a community bondage, so personal sins bring personal bondage. We can no more obtain happiness and freedom by ignoring God and His commandments than we can reap a harvest from scattered seeds scattered in the ocean. Chapter 12, verse 1. I will visit them in my anger, yea, in my fierce anger. God's anger is His righteous use of justice. Because of the people of King Noah would not repent, then God's justice required punishment, which the people chose to be, afflict, to be afflicted upon them because of their unrighteous use of agency. As Alma stated in Alma 42, now repentance could not come unto men except there was a punishment, which also was eternal as the life of the soul should be, a fixed opposite to the plan of happiness, which was as eternal also as the life of the soul. Now how could a man repent except he should sin? Now how could he sin if there was no law? And how could there be a law so there was a punishment? Now there was a punishment affixed, and a just law given, which brought remorse of conscience unto man. And if there was no law given, if men sinned, what could justice do, or mercy either? For they would have no claim upon the creature. But there is a law given, and a punishment affixed, and repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth, otherwise justice claimeth the creature, and executeth the law. And the law inflicteth the punishment. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. In short, or in other words, Alma is saying, mercy cannot rob justice. Mercy is not unconditional. Mercy is based upon the conditions of repentance. You don't repent, then justice must be inflicted upon that person, on that family, or that nation, whatever the case may be. Chapter 12, verse 6, the phrase, They shall also be smitten by the east wind. This is an old world cultural symbol. The people of the Bible recognize the existence of poor prevailing winds as issuing, broadly speaking, from the four corner points, north, south, east, and west. This is inferred from the custom... I'm sorry. The character of the directional winds was so consistent, varying not in nature, but only in degree throughout the seasons, that they came to be viewed as messengers from God. The north wind is cold. The west wind coming from the Mediterranean Sea is moist. The south warm and the east, which crosses the sandy wastes of the Arabian desert before reaching Palestine, can be violent and destructive. It was called the wind of the wilderness. And so that's why they talk about the east wind smiting and destroying. Chapter 12, verse 8, the phrase, they shall leave a record behind them. The testimony of history is most eloquent in warning against wickedness. Within the Book of Mormon, we have the testimony of three civilizations, Jerites, Mulekites, and Nephites, that God will indeed destroy the wicked from off the face of the earth. Such is just a prelude to destruction that will precede the great millennial day. President Kimball said on one occasion, brothers and sisters, that Christ is under no obligation to save this world. If we become wicked, we will be destroyed. Hopefully there's a remnant of us that chooses not to. That's what the scriptures prophesied, but that is still up to us as a remnant of Israel if we are going to break free from the wickedness of the world. Chapter 12, verses 9 through 17. Bound and imprisoned, Benedict now awaits the mockery of a trial. In it all we see no effort to find truth or establish the prophet's innocence. All that is said by the priest of Noah will seek to discredit, to refute, confound, and destroy. Such is the spirit that is universal to the servants of the adversary. Such is the spirit of those seeking to oppose the Book of Mormon in our day. They give no credence to the teachings or testimony of the book. Rather, all their efforts center in attempts to refute, confound, and destroy. Thus these ancient priests assured their fate, as do their modern counterparts, unless they repent. Chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. O king, what great evil hast thou done? We are guiltless. This is why the guilty take the truth to be hard. They cannot see nor admit their wickedness. They hide behind the rationalization of their thoughts, words, and deeds are acceptable, and that any exposure of their wickedness is a lie by those sent to preach righteousness. Satan has convinced them that good is evil and that evil is good. 12 verse 19, the phrase for he did withstand them in all their questions and did confound them in all their words. 
Falsehood must flee before truth, as the darkness of night flees before the rays of the rising sun. Abinadi, like Stephen before the Sanhedrin, confounded the supposedly wise of his day with the power and simplicity of the gospel. Chapter 12, verses 20 through 24. What meaneth the words which are written, and which now have been taught by our fathers? The wicked priest of Noah asked Abinadi. In the hopes of ensnaring Abinadi, one of King Noah's priests quoted what we know as Isaiah 52, 7 through 10, here in chapter 12, verses 21 through 24, and asked what is meant. It is though the priest had asked, why is it that you bring a message of gloom, a message of rebuke, given that Isaiah taught that the servants of the Lord would bring glad tidings? Abinadi's explanation of these verses comes at the end of Mosiah 15. Before giving that response, however, he quotes from what we know as Isaiah 53 and bearing testimony of Jesus the Messiah. The the gospel message is a message of glad tidings to the righteous. That's why these wicked priests are getting confused. We thought that a righteous priest from Jehovah would preach a message of glad tidings, but you're preaching doom and bondage and captivity. That can't be right. Who's right? You or Isaiah? Well, they're both right. Because of their wickedness, they have a message of gloom and doom, which Isaiah later in his writings pronounced upon Israel in his day. This shows you how unfamiliar with the scriptures the wicked priests of King Noah were. Chapter 12, verse 21, the phrase, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, meant, There is no more beautiful sight to those in bondage than he who comes to liberate them. Isaiah's description is of the missionaries who go forth fearlessly, declaring the message of the restored gospel. The good tidings spoken of here are the good news, the glad tidings of the gospel. The phrase that perishes, that publishes salvation, thy God reigneth, meant to publish salvation is to announce the ultimate triumph of God, and speaking of a future day when the people would see the salvation of their God. Isaiah had referenced the millennial day of victory, that day in which truth will have prevailed, and in which Christ will reign over all as King of Kings. Chapter 12, verse 22, the phrase, Watchmen shall lift up their voices, meant the watchmen are those who declare the message of salvation, those who are set to watch and who are set to watch and raise the warning voice. Abinadi is a perfect example of a watchman lifting up that voice of warning. The phrase, they shall see eye to eye, meant in that millennial day when the Lord of the Lord, co- when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the water covers the sea, and the gathered hosts of Israel have been brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, no longer professing a multiplicity of faith, in that day they shall see eye to eye. The phrase in verse 22, the Lord shall bring again Zion, meant Isaiah was describing the future restoration of the kingdom of Israel and the building of Zion, which we are living in the times of trying to build that. Chapter 12, verses 23 through 24, the phrase, Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, meant describing the joyous day of the Lord's ultimate triumph, is Isaiah wrote, quote, Break forth into sing, joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath confound, comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of their God. End of Isaiah. This is but to say, Israel, your redemption rests with the Lord. He alone can save you. By his power and none other will you be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. It is for him to restore you to that position of power and glory enjoyed in David's day. And all the world shall see it and acknowledge that the God of heaven hath done it. All shall see that the victory rests with the Lord Jehovah. That's when they will sing and there will be glad tidings of great joy. The king, priests of King Noah didn't understand the scriptures. Because of their wickedness, they have to have a message of doom and gloom. Just as Isaiah gave a message of doom and gloom to ancient Israel because they would not repent. But when Christ finally comes and the repentant are restored to him, then you will see 
how this gospel will bring glad tidings of great joy. Chapter 12, verses 25 through 26, the phrase, Are you priests and pretend to teach this people and to understand the spirit of prophesying? meant the priests of Noah, professing to be the watchmen of the Lord, assumed the responsibility to warn their people of impending dangers. Not only did they fail to keep the watch, but they became instigators of the very evils from which they worked to protect their people. They became as wolves in sheep's clothing. They and all their counterparts in earth's history will stand without defense at the day of judgment. They can make no claim to ignorance, for they profess both the knowledge of God and the authority to act in his name. They have taken the name of the Lord in vain, and such will not be found guiltless. Were there, were there's, were, were this not crime enough, they have added their own works of darkness and then enticed others to follow their evil example. Properly, Abinadi says, woe be unto you for perverting the ways of the Lord. 12.26, the phrase, you have perverted the ways of the Lord, refers to, it is a perversion of truth to know it and not teach it. All are required to teach and bear witness of the truth to the extent that they have that truth. The priests of Noah were claiming they had the truth. Well, they should have been teaching it. They were not. They probably had been taught at one time or another in their life, and they have apostatized from it. Chapter 12, verse 27, the phrase, Ye have not applied your hearts to understanding, meant, Undoubtedly, the priests of Noah were men of learning and intellect, yet they had no wisdom, no understanding of the heart, which is having been converted to the truth. Having the truth of understanding heart means you are converted to it. They were men of learning and intellect, but they were not converted to truth. In this, they were typical of many who reject the gospel while we professing to accept it. In our day, it was of professors of religion, the Lord said. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for the doctrines, the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Describing those of his own day who rejected him, the Savior needed only to repeat what he had said of his people of Isaiah's day, quote, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts. Understanding comes in the heart, not the head, and should be converted, and I should heal them. We need to apply to understanding. It's not just to know the doctrines and principles of the gospel. It is to understand them, which means get them into our heart, that they are written upon our heart, and we live them no matter what comes. Chapter 12, verses 28 through 29, the Nephites lived the law of Moses in the sense that they obeyed the endless ethical laws and abided by the myriad moral restrictions. They observed the law of animal sacrifice, but theirs was not a Levitical lifestyle. They had the higher priesthood and the everlasting gospel. There were no Levites. There were just Ephraim and Manasseh, so they had the Melchizedek priesthood. There were no Levites among them. Their vision was more keen than that of their old world kinsmen. They were able to recognize the person and powers and religion of Christ the Lord behind the ritual of the preparatory gospel. So the Nephites saw how the law of Moses pointed to Christ, where the Israelites in the old world thought the law of Moses would save you instead of pointing to Christ who saved them. We note with interest that Abinadi did not ask the priests of Noah, why have you not lived the laws of purification? Why have you not adhered to the intricacies of the dietary code? Why have you not held the point of feasts and festivals? Because all those were point to Christ. That's why he's continually he's talking about Christ. Because all those things are meaningless without the atonement of Jesus Christ. Rather, Abinadi's concern was with morality and decency, with the proper handling of riches or temporal resources, with obedience to the commandments given to Moses on Sinai. Or in other words, pointing their souls to Christ. Chapter 12, verse 30, the phrase, Ye know that I speak the truth. No one as priest knew that I spoke the truth, which means they had been had it taught at one time. 
Indeed, had they not known so, they could not have been fearful of his words. Had Abinadi been a false prophet, he could not have wandered the streets of the city of Lehi-Nephi with freedom to speak to any that would listen. The kingdom of darkness and falsehood is at war with itself. Its contention is with light and truth. I'm sorry. The kingdom of darkness and falsehood is not at war with itself. Its contention is with light and truth. There is a power in the truths of salvation that kindles the fire of faith and courage in those that accept them or burns with bitterness and hatred in the hearts of those who reject them. Every accountable soul has been born with the ability to recognize the truth of salvation. That's because we have the light of Christ. To accept those truths, it is to be immersed in the spirit they bring. To reject them is to be immersed in the spirit that opposes them. Brothers and sisters, what spirit are we immersing ourselves in? Day today. Chapter 12, verse 31. The phrase, does salvation come by the law of Moses? They asked Abinadi. Having quoted this verse, and Bruce R. McConkie said, after teaching them some of the great truths of salvation, Abinadi answered his own question. Salvation cometh not. Salvation cometh, I'm sorry, salvation doth not come. That should be doth, not cause. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Salvation doth not come by the law alone, he said. I, and were it not for the atonement which God himself shall make for the sins and iniquities of his people, that they must unavoidably perish, notwithstanding the law of Moses. Salvation is not in the works, not even those revealed of God, but in Christ and his atonement. So why do we do works of righteousness and keep the commandments? Because Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's our way to show our faith and love. They will not save us. The works of the law of Moses cannot save us. The works of the gospel today in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints through covenants and ordinances cannot save us. We do them because God has commanded us and we love him and then his atonement can be applied in our life. That is what saves us. Now, let us suppose a modern-day case. Suppose we have the scriptures, the gospel, the preaching, the church, the ordinances, the organization, even the keys of the kingdom. Everything that is now is down to the last jot and tittle, and yet there is no atonement of Christ. What then? Can we be saved? Will all our good works save us? Will we be rewarded for all our righteousness? Most assuredly, we will not. We are not saved by works alone, no matter how good. We are saved because God sent his son to shed his blood in Gethsemane and on Calvary that all through him might be ransomed be. We are saved by the blood of Christ. To paraphrase Abinadi, salvation, I'm sorry, that should be death again. Boy, I did not catch that. Salvation does not come by the church alone. And were it not for the atonement given by the grace of God as a free gift, all men must avoidably perished, and this notwithstanding the church and all that appertains to it. End of Elder McConkie's quote. Chapter 12, verse 32. The phrase they answered and said that salvation did come by the law of Moses. Noah and his priests, like apostate Israel in the old world, sought salvation in ritual observance. Theirs was, not, theirs was but a whited sepulcher or a form of godliness used to hide their wicked deeds. Of such ritual without righteousness, the Lord said, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offering of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the nose of thy songs. The noise of thy song, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials, but let the judgments run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. God does not give us riches in the church just to perform rituals. They are pointed and given to point to Christ. And if they do not, then he hates our works of just ritual performance without the atonement of Jesus Christ and conversion to Christ and him alone. 
No ritual performed is acceptable to the Lord that is not sustained by righteousness on the part of those participating in it. If the ritual of baptism be the example, it is of none effect unless it be accompanied by true repentance. Redemption comes only in and through the atonement of Christ. That was true in their day. Salvation did not come by the law of Moses, and it is true today. Salvation does not come by the gospel ordinances and covenants. It comes through the merit and grace of Jesus Christ. So may we let them point our souls to him. The phrase salvation doth not come by the law alone. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles testified of the absolute need for Jesus Christ even when we live righteously. Men and women unquestionably have impressive powers and can bring to pass great things. But after all our obedience and good works, we cannot be saved from death or the effects of our individual sins without the grace attended by the atonement of Jesus Christ. The Book of Mormon makes it clear makes this clear. It teaches that salvation doth not come by the law alone. In other words, salvation does not come by simply by keeping the commandments. But the law, no flesh, by the law, no flesh is justified. Even those who try to obey and serve God with all their heart, might, mind, and strength are unprofitable servants. Man cannot earn his own salvation. End of Elder Oaks quote. Chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. There is no salvation in rejecting Christ or in obedience, disobedience to his commandments. Neither the law of Moses nor the fullness of the gospel can, have a sing, can save a single soul independent of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Salvation is in Christ and must come by obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel as instituted by him. Here Abinadi charges known the priests with their idolatry. They profess salvation through the observance of ritual, the meaning of which they do not understand, and the commandments that give it efficacy and life they have eschewed. Further, they have not filled their obligation as priests to teach the things to the, teach these things to the people. Abinadi now comes to them as Moses did to Israel, and they cannot rest until they have put him to death. See, their only choice was we either kill him or we repent. The same was true with Christ. We either kill him or we must repent. The same is true with Joseph Smith. Either you repent and he's a prophet or you must get rid of him in your life and kill him, so to speak. Let's now go to Mosiah chapter 13. 13 verse 1, the phrase, slay him for he is mad. Might we ask, is madness a crime? And if so, is it, is it one justified, just, just, I'm sorry, is it one justly punishable by death? We also know with interest the verity that purity and truth can tolerate the existence of wickedness and falsehood, Why the reverse never seems to be the case. Wickedness and falsehood, like weeds, seek to exclude, retard, and strangle. That's what produces good fruit, remnant, beauty, and fragrance. So wickedness and falsehood cannot tolerate and be tolerant of truth. But it's interesting that truth can be tolerant of wickedness and evil. 13. Verses 2 through 3, the phrase, God will not suffer that I should be destroyed at this time. The servants of the Lord are endowed with power from on high, and the promise of protection that might be accomplished, accom accomplished the Lord's errand. The power of darkness for all their seeming might cannot defeat the purposes of the Lord. They may hinder the Lord's servants, it is true, but they cannot prevent the accomplishment of his purposes. I believe that the newspaper after Joe Smith was killed said Joe Smith dead Mormon or killed Mormonism is now dead oh little did they know that killing Joseph Smith just set it afire that a dischurched and gospel was spread throughout all the earth we are reminded of the attempt of those in Nazareth to kill the Christ and of his passing through the midst of them such that they could not lay hand upon him again in the temple they sought to take him but no man laid hand on him because his hour is not yet come of yet another occasion we read they sought him to take him but he escaped out of their hands as with Christ so with his faithful servants each has the protection of heaven and the accomplishment of his mission or her mission they were not going to be able to take Abinadi until his mission was completed 
13 verse 4, the phrase, Because I have told you the truth, you are angry with me. Nephi said it well, Woe unto all those who tremble and are angry because of the truth of God. For behold, he that is built upon the rock receive it with gladness. He that is built upon a soundy foundation trembleth, lest he should fall. The phrase, Ye have judged me that I am mad. By such a judgment, Abinadi is placed in the best of company, for such was the judgments made of Enoch, Paul, Joseph Smith. Chapter 13, 13, verse 5, the phrase, his face shone with seeding luster. Abinadi, like Stephen in the New Testament, is so filled with the Holy Ghost that he has been transfigured. Of Stephen's defense before a light council in the old world, we read, all that sat in council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Those rejecting the testimony of Abinadi or Stephen are condemned by that which they have seen, that which they have heard, and that which they have felt within their souls. Chapter 13, verse 7, the phrase, ye have no power to slay me. Their bounds are set, the Lord told Joseph Smith, relative to his enemies. They cannot pass. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore, fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. Just like Abinadi, Joseph Smith, too, would be able to complete and fulfill his mission before his time was to come and give his testimony with his blood. As it was with Joseph Smith, so it is with the Benedi, and for that matter, so is it with all the household of faith. The phrase, it cuts you to your hearts, meant the word of the Lord is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The truth will cut to the very center. 13 verse 8, the phrase, my words fill you with anger. Nephi explained it blessed when he said, And it, God's word, speaketh harshly against sin, according to the plainness of the truth. Wherefore, no man will be angry at the words which I have written, save he shall be of the spirit of the devil. That's how you can tell those who are of Satan that if we are angry with God and his anointed servant's word. Chapter 13, verse 9, The phrase, It matters not whether I go, if it so be that I am saved. Christ lived but 33 years, Joseph Smith the great prophet of the Restoration but 38. Their greatness is not to be measured in the number of years they lived, but rather in that for which they lived. So it was with Abinadi. The message is greater than the messenger. His faithfulness was stronger than the cords of death. Chapter 13, verse 10, the phrase, What you do with me after this shall be a type and a shadow of things to come. By slaying Abinadi, Noah and his priests condemned themselves to death. In killing him with fire, they chose the manner of their own or their descendants' death. They were to reap as they had sown. Similarly, had they chosen to repent and accept his message, their eternal reward would have been the same as Abinadi's. He that receiveth a prophet, the name of prophet receiveth a prophet's reward. Brothers and sisters, in the end, we will get what we want. They got what they want. They wanted to be unrepentant and wicked and not follow God, and so they got the consequences of what they wanted. Elder Maxwell is famous for saying, make sure you want the consequences of what you want. Let me say that again. Make sure you want the consequences of what you want. Chapter 13, verses 11 through 24. Now I read unto you the remainder of the commandments of God. Abinadi now completes his reading of what he calls the commandments of God, or which we have come to know as the Ten Commandments, or the Decalogue. He does not comment on the commandments, except to say that Noah and his priests have not kept them, nor have they taught them to their people. That they had the commandments available to them is evident from the fact that Abinadi is reading, not quoting them. See verse 11. However, they were not written in their hearts where true conversion takes place. The context in which Abinadi places the commandments is helpful in gaining a proper understanding of them. It is common in our day to hear someone make an expression to the effect that if only people would live the Ten Commandments, the great problems and difficulties that beset the world would disappear. Surely this would greatly improve the world in which we live, but it need be understood, as Abinadi is about to testify, that neither the law of Moses nor the Ten Commandments can of themselves bring salvation. Salvation comes only in and through Christ. 
It would be marvelous to live in a society in which there was no killing, adultery, stealing, lying, coveting, and so on. Yet if that were the extent of the gospel given us, though we would have temporal peace and tranquility, we would be without such things as the gift of the Holy Ghost, the priesthood, the promise of the resurrection, and the hope of eternal life. The promise of the gospel reaches far beyond Israel's covenant to keep the Ten Commandments. Again, we keep the commandments to show our love for Christ. In all of this, there is a great lesson. Ethics without doctrine is like the body without the spirit. It may have the same appearance, but is void of the power of life. The Ten Commandments, independent of the fullness of the gospel, are little more than an anemic theology in the hands of social reformers, being bereft of the laws and ornaments of the gospel. Similarly, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, detached from the testimony of Christ's divine sonship, is but a curriculum for a civics class, rather than a testament of those verities or truths by which one obtains everlasting life. Though the Ten Commandments constitute an excellent standard for nations and peoples, their greater value is found in the conjunction with the fullness of the gospel of which they are a part. To isolate the Ten Commandments from the God who gave them and from the spirit of revelation by which they came is to lose much of their strength and purpose. The context in which they were given was that of a covenant between God and a people that they had been chosen to become a peculiar treasure to the Lord, even a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Some have mistakenly supposed that the Ten Commandments were part of the Law of Moses. In fact, they are a part of the higher law, or the fullness of the gospel. Notice that even in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments were given long before he gave the Law of Moses to the people. It is a part of the higher law of the Melchizedek priesthood. This is illustrated by their reiteration to us of as part of the restoration of all things. The Ten Commandments were part of the fullness of the gospel as first given to Moses on Sinai. Though the higher priests and ordinances were taken from Israel because of their tra or transgressions, when Moses returned to Sinai to receive what we know as the Law of Moses, the Ten Commandments were retained as part of Israel's covenant with God. The tablets upon which the commandments were written were those housed in the Ark of the Covenant, so named because the commandments constituted their covenant. Similarly, when the Ark of the Covenant was housed in the tabernacle in the wilderness, it became known as the Ark of the Testimony, this name having reference to Israel's covenant to abide the law given on Sinai. Thus it was by covenant that Israel had agreed to live the law of Moses and to keep the Ten Commandments. Moses expressly told the Israelites that in breaking this covenant, they would re subject themselves to dispersion and destruction. Having broken their covenant, King Noah and his people have forfeited their right to the protection of heaven. So is true with us. If we will break our covenants, may the Lord, then we forfeit our rights to his protection. Chapter 13, verses 27 through 28. Neither the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, nor even the fullness of the gospel contain, independent of Christ's atonement, the power of salvation. Salvation is in Christ, not in the law. The law of Moses was given to point ancient Israel to the Savior and his atoning sacrifice. And, in, and only in and through that sacrifice can one be saved. That was the whole purpose and point of the law of Moses, was to point them to Christ's atoning sacrifice. Ancient Israel had missed that point. Noah and his wicked priest had missed that point. Are we going to make the same mistake and live the gospel but not point us to Christ? Chapter 13, verses 29 through 31, the phrase, It was expedient there should be a law given to the children of Israel, meant, In its wickedness, Israel was given a law of carnal commandments. The concept of carnal commandments does not refer to the lust of the flesh alone, but rather to all that is worldly as contrasted with the things of the Spirit. The law was replete with daily reminders that Israel was to be a people set apart and consecrated to the Lord, and that in all things they must keep themselves clean and pure. Virtually all aspects of their lives were drawn upon as types or reminders of who and what they were to be. Birth and death, seed time and harvest time, their diet, the manner and food which was prepared, their Sabbaths and feast time, even disease and restoration to health were all used to typify their obligation to God. The law also contained a host of sacrificial rituals that served to keep constantly before them their dependency on the great sacrifice yet to be offered by the Son of God. Ancient Israel was so 
low in spirituality that they needed things to constantly remind them day after day after day. And so that's why the law of Moses had to do with the Sabbath, with disease, with feast days, with prepared certain foods which are clean and unclean, with harvest time. So God was constantly trying to teach them about his son and to be clean and to come into his son on a daily basis. He's hoping we don't need daily reminders that we can go to church, partake of the sacrament, and throughout the week always remember him. See, we are to be higher than ancient Israel, brothers and sisters, and not to be reminded day after day, but we can keep ourselves in the covenant day after day. In addition to the carnal law, Israel enjoyed a portion of the gospel law, including the invitation to exercise faith in Christ, to repent and be baptized by immersion for the remission of sins. Further, they held the keys of the ministry of angels through those of the tribe of Levi, who held the lesser or Aaronic priesthood. Together, the carnal law and the lesser portion of the gospel law enjoined by Israel constituted a preparatory gospel, its purpose being to prepare them to accept Christ and receive once again the gospel in its fullness. Well, we know that they didn't accept Christ, the majority of Israel, when he came. So it shows you how they lost that idea that it didn't prepare them for when he came. They thought the law of Moses would save them alone. They lost what it pointed to. And thus, the majority of Israel, when Christ comes in the New Testament, do not accept him. Hopefully we do not make the same mistake. Chapter, oh, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught how the law of Moses relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Quote, the modern reader should not see the Mosaic Code anciently or modern times as simply a tedious set of rich, religious rituals, slavishly and sometimes militantly, followed by a stiff-necked people who did not accept the gospel, uh, did not accept the Christ and his gospel. This historic covenant given by the hand of God himself was a guide to spirituality, a gateway to Christ. It is critical to understand that the law of Moses was overlaid upon and thereby included many basic parts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which had existed before it. It was never intended to be something apart or separate from, and certainly not something antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Its purchase was never to have been different from the higher law. Both were to bring people to Christ. The law of Moses taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not something in addition to the gospel. It teaches the gospel of Christ through types and symbols. The people had missed the types and symbols. 13 verse 31, the phrase, all these things were types of things to come. As every doctrine in the fullness of the gospel grows out of or is an appendage to the atonement, so every ritual of the Mosaic law pointed to Christ and his atoning sacrifice. This is the whole meaning of the law, Amulek explained. Every whip pointing to the great and last sacrifice, and that great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. Further, the entirety of the law of Moses was symbolic. It was a system of vicarious ordinances, all of which had as their purpose to center attention and faith in the great vicarious ordinances that brought life and hope of salvation to all who would believe. The doctrines of atonement, redemption, punishment, and forgiveness were all taught through vicarious offerings. The bullock, lamb, goat, ox, and dove were all substitutes, the lifeblood of each being offered in behalf of the one sacrificing. The whole system was one of vicarious ordinances and proxies, all pointing to the great vicarious sacrifice and the great proxy for us all, meaning Christ's atonement. Chapter 13, verse 32, the phrase, They did not understand the law because of the hardness of their hearts. The great purpose of the law of Moses was to keep its adherents clean and pure, that they might be susceptible to the witness of the Spirit and thus be prepared to accept the Messiah. From what Abinadi has said, it appears that some in the old world discerned the higher the higher spiritual meaning of the law, as a witness of Christ. Many of the nation of Israel, though observant of the outward ordinance of the law, lost their understanding of its function and purpose through wickedness, and thus hardened their hearts against Christ when he came to them. So there were some, we just don't have a record of it in the Old Testament, who the law pointed to Christ, and they were further to progress. But most of ancient Israel lost the understanding and meaning of the ordinances and covenants of the law of Moses in pointing them to Christ. 13 verses 33 through 35, the phrase did not Moses prophesy concerning, prophesying to them concerning the coming of the Messiah. 
No prophecy is repeated more often in the scripture than Moses' promise relative to the coming of Christ. Peter quoted it in these words, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, Christ, shall be destroyed from among the people. Stephen quoted it to the Sanhedrin that put him to death. Lehi and Nephi both quoted it to their families. Christ quoted it to the nation of the Nephites. Moroni quoted it to Joseph Smith, and we find it referred to in the Doctrine and Covenants. Abinadi said that Moses did prophesy not only the coming of the Messiah, but also that he would redeem his people. Though the law of Moses centers in a redeeming sacrifice to be made by the Messiah, we have no Old Testament text in which Moses plainly states that the Messiah will come in a redemptive role. We are not, however, without perfect confidence that Moses understood and taught the redemptive role of Christ. That is just missing in our Old Testament. It's probably on the brass plates. Indeed, it was to Moses the Lord said, This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. All prophets, and this is from the days of Adam, have known that Jesus is the Christ, God incarnate, and that he would bring to pass the resurrection of the dead. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 13 verse 34, the phrase, God, him, God himself should come down. The term God generally refers to Heavenly Father, and it is Him whom we ultimately worship. It is also true that Jesus Christ is God. Saints of the Old Testament era knew Him as knew Him as Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Elder James E. Talmage of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that the Scriptures help us understand the divinity of Jesus Christ and His role as a God. Quote, we claim scriptural authority for the assertion that Jesus Christ was and is God the Creator. The God who revealed himself to Adam, Enoch, and all the antediluvian patriarchs and prophets down to Noah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Israel as a united people. The God of Ephraim and Judah after the disruption of the Hebrew nation. The God who made himself known to the prophets from Moses to Malachi. The God of the Old Testament record and the God of the Nephites. We affirm that Jesus Christ was and is Jehovah, the Eternal One. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 35, this verse is but a preface to chapters 14 and 15, where Abinadi will discuss the condescension, oppression, and affliction, and resurrection of the Messiah. So let's now go to Mosiah, chapter 14. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. To powerfully teach the importance of the Savior's atonement, Abinadi quoted the entire chapter of Isaiah 53, of which no one is priest, neglected to teach the people about because they did not understand the law of Moses and how it pointed to the Savior and his life. Chapter 14, verse 1, the phrase, Who hath believed our report? The chapter begins with a rhetorical question, which is, in effect, Who hath accepted the testimony of the prophets relative to the Messiah? Who will believe the witness borne by apostles and prophets the divinity son, to the divine sonship of Jesus of Nazareth? And in our own day, who will hear the voice of his living prophets? The phrase, To whom is the Lord arm of the Lord revealed meant, that is, to whom has God revealed this priest in his gospel, those things wherein is found the power of God unto salvation. The text affirms that the knowledge of such things can only be can can be had only by revelation. Without revelation there can be no priesthood, for if priesthood is the power to act for God, God must tell the priest to bear how to act on his behalf. One can hardly argue that he was that priesthood is the power I'm sorry, one can hardly argue that he was God's agent while admitting that God refused to speak to him. Nor could he borrow the commission given to others. A priesthood that cannot trace itself to the throne of God is no priesthood. Nor could one legitimately claim to have the gospel of salvation without revelation. The gospel is not the creation of scholarship, the fiat of legislatures, or the masterwork of philosophers. It is and can be nothing more nor less than the revelation and power of heaven. All truths of salvation must of necessity profess revelation as their source. So any religious leader, priest of anything that denies modern revelation is not a true priest and prophet of God. Because God can only, and his gospel can only be known by revelation. And his church can only be guided by revelation. 
14 verse 2, the phrase, he shall grow up as a tender plant, meant Christ is the tender plant. The Lord Omnipotent would, like all his mortal fellows, experience the tender and helpless years of infancy and childhood. God himself should come down among the children of men and take upon him the form of man, Abinadi said. He whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting, was to be born a helpless infant to the youthful Mary in a stable in Bethlehem of Judea. The phrase, a root out of dry ground, referred to the dry, sterile ground of apostasy. Judaism neither watered nor nourished this plant, meaning Christ would come during the time of apostasy in Judaism. Jesus grew up with his brethren and waxed strong and waited upon the Lord for the time of his ministry to come. And he served under his father, and he spake not as other men, neither could he be taught, for he need not that any man should teach him. So who taught him? Well, his father did by revelation in visions or however he sought fit. The phrase, he hath no form nor comeliness, meant Christ never sat for a portrait, nor did the gospel writers trouble themselves to give us a physical description of him. It is appropriate that attention center on the message rather than the messenger. For this same reason, no details of Christ's personal life have been preserved for us. Chapter 14, verse 3, the phrase, he is despised and rejected of men, meant, as his physical appearance was not unusually attractive to the eye of the natural man, neither was his message appealing to the care of those without spiritual inclination. Few among the Jews were willing to accept a Messiah sent to descend and blow all things. After his bread of life sermon in Capernaum, even many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Indeed, so great was the number of those who turned back, from him he asked the twelve, Will ye go away also? The phrase, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, meant, He shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, Alma prophesied, and this that it, the word might be fulfilled, which saith he will take upon him the pains and the sickness of his people, and he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, according to the flesh, that he may know, according to the flesh, how to succor his people, according to their infirmities. The phrase, we esteemed him not, referred to, the nation of Israel refused their king, refused their king his throne, choosing instead to render to Caesar and corrupt priests those things which rightly belong to God. Our esteem for the Son of God is measured by our acceptance of our obedience to the principles of his gospel. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, John said in John fourteen twenty one. Chapter 14, verse 4, the phrase, we did, esteem, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, referred to. It was common to the, to the Meridian apostles to testify that Christ had been hanged on a tree. This in reference to the death on the cross. They did so to dramatize that the Jews claimed Christ to have been rejected and smitten of God. The ancient law held that if a man had been proven guilty of a capital charge and put to death, usually by stoning, as an additional disgrace and lesson to the community, his body might be hung upon a tree for all to see. If this was done, it was required that the body be taken down and buried by evening, so that the land would not be defiled. For the scripture states, He that is hanged is cursed of God. This is why the Jews wanted Christ to be crucified, because it was as if he were hung from a tree, which was a sign of disgrace. See, they're saying if he was truly the Son of God, he wouldn't have let to be disgraced so bad. Chapter 14, verse 5. The phrase, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, means, he who was the Prince of Peace, who had never known the loss of peace that follows in the wake of backward steps or moral detours, became vicariously in Gethsemane and all cavalry sin for us. He bore on his own shoulders the vicarious but vicious load of world sin, world sins, and thereby came to know for himself the consequence of sin, the loss of the Father's spirit. Chapter 14, verse 5, the phrase, With his stripes we are healed, meant in reference to the suffering of Jesus Christ during the atonement and his healing power. That's what it means by with his stripes. Elder M. Russell Ballard shared the following, what peace, what comfort this great gift is, which comes through the loving grace of Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Redeemer of all mankind. 
Even though his life was pure and free of sin, he paid the ultimate penalty for sin, yours, mine, and everyone's who has ever lived. His mental, emotional, and spiritual anguish were so great they caused him to bleed from every pore. His mental, emotional, and spiritual anguish were so great that caused him to bleed from every pore. And yet Jesus suffered willingly so we might all have the opportunity to be washed clean through having faith in him. Without the atonement of the Lord, none of these blessings would be available to us, and we could not become worthy and prepared to return to dwell in the presence of God. End of quote. Chapter 14, verse 6, the phrase, Every one to his own way. That was the same thing as what he said in DNC 1 6, meaning they, those who have gone against the Lord, seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. That is the great calamity of our day, that we walk in our own way and do not walk to establish God's way. That's what we're seeking to overcome, our own way, and submitting to God's way. Chapter, 17, verse four, chapter 14, verse 7, the phrase, He opened not his mouth, meant, this makes reference to Jesus' refusal to respond to the testimony of false witnesses when he was tried before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. When he was asked, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? His silent disdain was no longer appropriate. I am, Jesus responded, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Chapter 14, verse 8, the phrase, He was taken from prison and from judgment meant a clear rendering of Isaiah's thought would be, without protection, without justice, he was taken away. So that's a better phrasing of that phrase. That is, he was taken forcibly and denied a fair trial. The phrase, who should declare his generation is, that is, who should declare his genesis, his roots, his origin, who among all that profess to be his minister can correctly testify to his divine sonship. In our day, the only ones who can testify are those who understand, as Nephi declared, that he is literally the son of the eternal father after the manner of the flesh. An understanding of the atonement rests upon a proper understanding of the doctrine of divine sonship. Of necessity, Christ had to be the literal son of a mortal mother from whom he could inherit blood or the capacity to die. God must be his father as literally as Mary was his mother, so that he might inherit from his eternal father the ability and capacity to live endlessly. Thus Christ became the only man ever to walk on the earth who had been both the ability to lay down his life, which he inherited from his mother, and the ability to take it up again, which power came by virtue as being the little offspring of the eternal Father. Chapter 14, verse 9, the phrase, He made his grave with the wicked, refers to. Isaiah's prophecy of Christ's death were fulfilled in remarkable detail, insomuch as he was crucified between two thieves. The phrase, which the rich, which with the rich in his death meant the lifeless body of Christ was laid in the grave owned by Joseph of Arimathea, a man of wealth. Chapter 14, verse 10, the phrase, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. A tenant to the fall came the promise of redemption. The first messianic prophecy was directed to Satan. Christ said to Satan, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, Eve, between thy seed, the chosen the those chosen to follow you, and her seed, and he, the seed of the woman, meaning Christ, shall bruise thy head, that would be saint heads, and thou shalt bruise, or I'm sorry, thou sh shalt bruise thy head, Satan said, and thou, sh thou, Satan, shall bruise his, Christ's heel. Satan will have his victories. He will bruise the hill of God, son. Yet the ultimate victory will be with Christ, who will bruise or crush the endowment says, the head of the adversary. Thus it pleased the Lord the Father to bruise him, Christ, in the sense that Jesus carried out to the fullness the will of the Father, in spite of the pain associated with the implementation of the terms and conditions of that will. 
Chapter 14, verse 10, the phrase, When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, meant, When the Lord of life had made the atoning sacrifice, when his blood had been shed in the garden and on the cross, when he had passed through death into the world of spirits, when these things were done, he would see his seed, an innumerable company of the spirits of the just, the righteous dead from the days of Adam. The phrase, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in the land, meant this prophecy was certainly not fulfilled in Christ's mortal life. For the Lord gave up his life as a ransom for many, while yet in his prime. Its fulfillment, therefore, will be seen in the Savior's rise from the death in an immortal resurrected state. Having surrendered his life in an atonement, he will live again, knowing his seed, and enjoy the peace and glory of eternal life. Chapter 14, verse 11, the phrase, travail of thy soul, meant Jesus suffered so mighty in the garden of Gethsemane in the process of bearing our iniquities that he bled from every poor. The suffering that Christ will undergo in performing the atonement, which will result in his seeing his seed, or those spiritually reborn in Christ, that's who are his seed, is likened to the travail, the pain and suffering of a woman, which precedes her being able to see her own seed or her newborn child. The phrase, he shall be satisfied, it is unclear whether the pronoun he in this sentence refers to the father or to the son, but ultimately it does not matter. Both the father and the son were well satisfied by what Jesus had accomplished in the Garden of Gethsemane. The phrase, by his knowledge, meant the Lord would have the knowledge he needed to perform the atonement, something that is simply beyond the comprehension to the rest of us. The phrase, my righteous servant, meant when shall the blood of the righteous be shed, asked Enoch, that all they that mourn may be sanctified and have eternal life. And the Lord said, it shall be in the meridian of time, in the days of wickedness and vengeance. And behold, Enoch saw the day of the coming of the Son of Man, even in the flesh, and his soul rejoiced, saying, The righteous is lifted up, and the Lamb is slain from the foundation of the world. Chapter 14, verse 12, the phrase, Divideth him a portion, the spoil, meant, As conqueror, Christ has won the right to the rewards of his efforts. The portion he will receive is to be an heir of God, receiving all the Father have, so also do all the righteous, but on Christ's merits, not their own. The phrase numbered with the transgressors meant, Mark referred to this prophecy when he wrote, and with him they crucified two thieves, the one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. The phrase in verse 12, poured out his soul into death, meant the scripture suggests that pouring out the soul is to experience great pain and sorrow, which Christ experienced unto death. Another interpretation may be based on the idea of pouring out the soul in prayer. When we pour out our souls in prayer, we express our deepest, most heartfelt desires to the Lord, holding nothing back. So it was with Christ, as he poured out his soul unto the Father, he also fully yielded to his Father's will, even unto death. The phrase made intercession for the transgressors means Jesus Christ is the one who makes intercession for us. Paul wrote, It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. Lehi said that Christ shall make intercession for all the children of men, and they that believe in him shall be saved. And because of the intercession for all, all men come unto God. Wherefore, they stand in the presence of him... Uh, in the presence of him, to be judged of him. Because of the resurrection, all of us will make it back to God's presence. That's how the resurrection overcame the fall of Adam. Brothers and sisters, you have to do nothing to get back into the presence of God. The resurrection will bring us back to be judged by God. Now, if you want to stay there and live with God and Christ and have eternal life, then that's a whole different matter. Then you must have ordinances and covenants in order to do that and endure to the end. But the resurrection gets all back to God, just as Christ said it would. With the role and power of intercessor, Christ stands between us and the Father, seeking blessings in our behalf. He prays for us, mediates, petitions, and intercedes, requesting mercy for the repentant. Christ has this power because he took 
our sins upon himself in his great atoning sacrifice. Wonderful examples of Christ acting in his intercessory role are found in his prayers he offered that are recorded in John 17 and 3 Nephi 19. Let's let's turn to Mosiah chapter 15. Abinadi's sermon to the priest of Noah contains one of the most penetrating, profound, though greatly misunderstood discussions of the role and mission of Jesus Christ in all of Holy Writ. Abinadi's message concerning the ministry of Christ as the Father and the Son, his teachings will be more understood if we proceed by a brief review of the manner in which the title Father is used in Scripture to re- in reference to deity. 15.1, the phrase, God himself shall come down, meant Jesus Christ is God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Mosiah, Abinadi, and Alma. Abinadi's teaching, the same doctrine declared earlier by Nephi and Benjamin, the condescension of God, the doctrine that the Lord Omnipotent, the Lord Jehovah, who's Christ, will come to earth, take a body of flesh and bones, and accomplish the work of redemption for all mankind. And Jesus Christ is a God. God, so God himself will come down, meaning Jesus Christ. 15 verses 2 through 3, because Jehovah Christ will have a physical body and dwell in the flesh, like every other mortal son and daughter of God, he will be known as the Son of God. At the same time, because he will be conceived by the power of God, he will thus have within him the powers of the Spirit. He will be known as the Father. In a modern revelation given to Joseph Smith, the Savior explained that he is the Father because he, Elohim, gave me, Christ, of his fullness, and the Son because I was in the world and made flesh my tabernacle and dwelt among the sons of men. Christ was known as the Son of God because his growth and development, like that of all the children of God, was gradual and took place on a pine lawn and precept upon precept. That is, he received grace for grace and continued from grace to grace until he received in the re- resurrection a fullness of the glory of the Father. And thus he was called the Son of God because he received not a fullness of first. So Christ will be a son and grow like we do, line upon line. But he is also the eternal Father of heaven and earth because of his mission and his atonement and his resurrection. Chapter 15, verse 2, the phrase, having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, meant the will of the Son was swallowed up in the will of the Father. That is, the flesh becomes subject to the Spirit, the mortal subject to the immortal. I seek not my own will, Jesus explained, but the will of the Father who hath sent me. Further, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. In short, Jesus did what Elohim would have him do. He carried out the full extent, the terms and conditions of the plan of the Father, of which he, Christ, was the chief advocate and proponent in pre-mortality. Verse 15, verse 15, verse 4, the phrase, they are one God, meant, without question, Elohim and Jehovah, though separate as personages, are one, one in mind, one in purpose, one in glory. Indeed, they are infinitely more one than they are separate. This has probably been referred to as the greatest teaching device ever devised in all eternity. The whole plan of salvation centers in our learning to be one with Christ, as he is one with the Father. The doctrine of oneness is the doctrine of salvation. So they are one God is referring to that they are oneness in salvation, in purpose, in plan, in perfection. Also, they are one God can refer to as Jehovah in the pure life, who now comes down as Jesus in this mortal life. Both Jehovah and Jesus are one God. So that's another way that one God can be interpreted. Jehovah promised to do the will of the Father. Jesus came down and accomplished the will of the Father. Jehovah and Jesus are the same person, one God. Abinadi's purpose in this sermon, however, is to declare more than the unity of Godhead. He is the pronouncement of pronouncements, the doctrine of doctrines, the message of messages, which is that Christ is God. And it if it were not so, he could not save us. That is, Abinadi is declaring the true doctrine of the Incarnation. He is teaching and testifying that God, Jehovah, will become a man, Jesus, and that 
he who was the great spirit shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay. And Jehovah and Jesus Christ is one and the same person, one God. In summary, Christ will be both the Father and the Son. He will be called the Father because he was conceived by the power of God and inherited all the divine endowments, including immortality, from his exalted sire, the Father. He will be called the Son because of his flesh, his mortal inheritance from his mother Mary. Therefore, Christ will be both flesh and spirit, both man and God, both Son and Father, and they, the Father and the Son, the God and the man, the spirit and the flesh, are to be blended wondrously in one being, Jesus Christ, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. Indeed, the Book of Mormon is an additional witness with Paul that in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Chapter 15, verse 5, being one God, meaning after having discussed the doctrine of Christ, the gospel Nephi wrote, And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And then behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only true doctrine of the Father and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God, without end. Amen. In speaking of resurrected beings, Amulus explained that they shall be brought and be arraigned before the bar of Christ, the Son of God, the God, and God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, which is one eternal God, to be judged according to the works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. The verity of verities is that the members of the eternal Godhead are one. To be judged of one is to be judged of all. To be blessed of one is to be blessed of all. And further, as explained earlier, Father and Son, Spirit and Flesh are brought together in one to form the one God, who is the very eternal Father of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. Chapter 15, verse 5, the phrase, Suffereth temptation, and yieldeth not to temptation. King Benjamin taught that the Savior would suffer temptation and pain of body, hunger, and thirst, and fatigue, even more than any man can suffer. Paul wrote that the Savior was in all points tempted like we are without sin. Joseph Smith declared to the school of the prophets that Jesus Christ is called the Son because of the flesh and descended in suffering below that which man can suffer, or in other words, suffered greater sufferings and was exposed to more powerful contradictions than any man can be. But notwithstanding all this, he kept the law of God and remained without sin, showing therefore that in it is in the power of man to keep the law and remain also without sin, and also that by him a righteous judgment might come upon all flesh, and that all who walk not in the law of God may justly be condemned by the law and have no excuse for their sins. Chapter 15, verse 6, the phrase, after working many mighty miracles, meant miracles and wonders, even those performed by the Lord of life, will not convert one who is slow to hear and even slower to feel the things of the Spirit. External proofs rarely substitute for in internal evidence. Faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. Chapter 15, verse 7. Abinadi continues to speak in parallels. The phrase, the flesh becoming subject even unto death, is intended to be read in parallel with the phrase which follows, the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the, follow, of the Father. Paul proclaimed to the Philippian saints that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion as man, he humbleth himself, and becometh obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Chapter 15, verse 8, the phrase, God breaketh the bands of death. Even in endless eternities, that which is mortal could never bring to pass that which is immortal. Flesh and blood is without the power to escape the inevitability of death. Resurrection and immortality are the handiwork of gods. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, could not conquer death. Jesus the Christ, the son of man of holiness, put all things, death included, under his feet. He who knew the shame of the cross arose with healing in his wings, that he might raise up all men in like manner. God, who is Jesus Christ, the same one who shall come down among the children of men, will swallow up death in the victory of the resurrection.
The phrase, having gained the victory over death, meant, through the atonement, death comes the servant of immortality. In a way incomprehensible to the mortal mind, the effect of Christ's resurrection will pass upon all who are descendants of Adam and Eve. Because Christ rose from the dead in glorious immortality, so shall all who qualify for the second estate rise from death to enjoy an eternal and inseparable union of body and spirit. The phrase, giving the Son power to make intercession, meant Jesus observed in times meridian, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and he hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. It is by the power of the Father the power of the Spirit, that Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection, draws all men unto him and to the Father. Chapter 15, verse 9, the phrase, having the bowels of mercy, being filled with compassion, meant the bowels symbolizes the seat of piety or kindness, hence tenderness and compassion. The Book of Mormon provides an insight into the meaning of the purpose of Christ's suffering that is nowhere found in the Bible. The doctrine that Christ suffered for all, not only that their sins might be forgiven, but also in order that his empathy and compassion for his brothers and sisters might be perfected. Quote, and he shall take upon himself death, that he may loose the bands of death, which bind his people, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, according to the flesh, that he may know, according to the flesh, how to succor his people, according to their infirmities. There is no pain, no anguish, no feeling or alienation with which our Lord is unfamiliar. He knows how to assist in time of need because he understands the cries of the soul of those who turn to him. Brothers and sisters, he has suffered all of our pains and sorrows. He knows how to succor us and help us if we will but turn to him. Chapter 15, verse 9, the phrase standing betwixt them and justice meant each of us, said Elder Boyd K. Packer, lives on a kind of spiritual credit. One day the account will be closed, a settlement demanded. However casual we may view it now, when the day comes and the foreclosure is in imminent, we will look around in restless agony for someone, anyone, to help us. Unless there is a mediator, unless we have a friend, the full weight of justice, untempered, unsympathetic, must positively, must fall on us. The full recompense for every transgression, however minor or however deep, will be exacted from us to the othermost fatherlings. But know this, truth, glorious truth proclaims there is such a mediator, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Through him mercy can be fully extended to each of us without offending the eternal law of justice. This truth is the very root of Christian doctrine. You may know how much you may know much about the gospel and its branches out from there, but if you only know the branches and those branches do not touch that root, if there have been cut free from that truth, there will be no life, nor substance, nor redemption in them. The extension of mercy will not be automatic. It will be through the covenant with him. It will be on his terms, his generous terms, which include, as an absolute essential, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. All mankind can be protected by the law of justice, and at once each of us individually may be extended the redeeming and healing blessings of mercy. End of quote. And that is all conditioned upon repentance. Chapter 15, verse 9, the phrase, having taken upon himself their iniquities, President John Taylor has written that in some mysterious, incomprehensible way, Jesus assumed the responsibility which naturally would have devolved upon Adam, but which could only be accomplished through the mediation of himself and by taking upon himself their sorrows, assuming their responsibilities and bearing their transgressions and sins. In a manner to us incomprehensible and inexplicable, he bore the weight of sin of the whole whole world, not only of Adam, but of his posterity. Thus it was that there came upon him the weight and agony of ages and generations, the indescribable agony consequence upon this great sacrificial atonement wherein he bore the sins of the world and suffered in his indescribable agony, I'm sorry, in his own person, the consequences of an eternal law of God broken by man. End of quote. 
The phrase satisfied demands of justice means the law of justice demands that there be a payment made for the breaking of the laws of God through sin, which punishment is affixed. And if there was no law given, if men sinned, what could justice do, nor mercy, nor, or mercy either? For they would have no claim upon the creature. But there is a law given, and a punishment affixed, and repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth. Otherwise, justice claimeth the creature, and executeth the law, and the law inflicteth the punishment. If not so, the works of justice could be would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. But God ceaseth not to be God, and mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement. And the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead bringeth men back into the presence of God, and thus they are restored into his presence, to be judged according to their works, according to the law of justice. For behold, justice exerciseth all his demands, and also mercy claimeth all which are his own, and thus none but the truly penitent are saved. What, do you suppose that mercy can run job justice? I say unto you, nay, not one whit. If so, God would cease to be God. So, if you don't want justice to demand its, its rewards and punishments, then use repentance to get mercy. Chapter 15, verses 10 through 13, The Seed of Christ. Elder Downley Jokes explain how one becomes a son or a daughter of Christ. Quote, In this great scripture from the Book of Mormon, we learn that those who are qualified by faith and repentance and compliance with the laws and ordinance of the gospel will have their sins borne by the Lord Jesus Christ. In spiritual and figurative terms, they will become the sons and daughters of Christ, heir to his kingdom. These are they who will be called by his name in the last day. While serving as presiding bishop, Elder Merrill J. Bateman described how Jesus Christ would see his seed. Quote, the Savior, as a member of the Godhead, knows each of us personally. Isaiah and the prophet of Benedi said that when Christ would make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Abinadi explained that his seed are the righteous, those who follow the prophets. In the garden and on the cross, Jesus saw each of us, and now and not only bore our sins, but also experienced our deepest feelings, so he would know how to comfort and strengthen us. End of quote. Chapter 15, verse 13, the phrase, The prophet that has not fallen into transgression. We do not espouse a doctrine of infallibility of prophets. It is common ploy in anti-Mormon literature to argue that the church is false because of the supposed error or the disaffection of one holding the prophetic office. All who come into mortality, the Savior included, are subject to the temptations of the father of lives, are open to the enticements of the flesh, even those specially selected and designated as the Lord's mouthpieces. With all their inspiration and greatness, prophets are yet mortal men with imperfections common to mankind in general. They have their opinions and prejudices and are left to work out their own problems without inspiration in many instances. The commandment is given to high and low, great and small, to take heed to themselves, lest they fall and succumb to temptation. So, brothers and sisters, we do not believe our prophets are infallible. But we do believe that they guide and direct this church through revelation on Jesus, from Jesus Christ. So if we want them to be perfect and infallible, then we too must require the same of ourselves. But if we want mercy, then we must also give them mercy. Chapter 15, verses 14 through 19, the phrase, They who have published peace. The proclamation of the gospel message is the proclamation of peace, and those called to declare the word are publishers of peace. Peace in the human soul and peace in the world can come only when men and women accept the teachings of the lowly Nazarene and apply his atoning blood in their behalf. You catch that? Peace only comes through Christ, brothers and sisters. It's not something that we as mankind will just do naturally on our own. No, we are fallen. We will not naturally do that. Being justified by faith, Paul wrote, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, a peace which passes human understanding. Peace I leave with you, the Master said. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. To one seeking an assurance of the truthfulness of the restored gospel, the Lord responded, Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? 
What greater witness can you have from God? The witness of the Spirit, that witness by which we have been promised, we may know the truth of all things, is the Spirit of peace. Such is the Spirit and the message of all who go forth in the Savior's name. Those who present the gospel message act as agents of Him, through whom salvation was and is and is to come. They talk of Him, rejoice in Him, preach of Him, prophesy of Him, also that they and those to whom they preach may have the peaceful assurance that he lives, that he may be known with certainty from whence a remission of sins and all blessings of heaven come. The Lord's legal administrators are those who publish peace, who declare salvation, who echo the testimony of Isaiah, Thy God reigneth. Brothers and sisters, Satan cannot duplicate the peace of the Holy Ghost. That's why if you ever fulfillings of peace, you can know of a perfect assurance that is from God. Only the Holy Ghost can give us peace and joy and happiness. While serving in the 70, Carlos E. Essay shared insight into the imagery of this statement from Isaiah. No one is more beautiful or more blessed than those who serve God by preaching and exemplifying the truth. It is the most sanctifying and beautifying label, labor of all. The feet of the voices, the face, and the whole being of those preachers who share saving truths will always be precious and beautiful to new converts, especially to those who have suffered in their sins. In the eyes of those who have learned of Christ and of his power to save, there are few, if any, blemishes in the missionaries who walk long distances to bring the gospel message. End of quote. Chapter 15, verses 20 through 27, the first resurrection. Jesus Christ, the first person on this earth to be resurrected, consequently the period of time referred to in the scriptures as the first resurrection, commenced with his triumph over the grave and continues through the millennium. Abinadi taught that those who would come forth in the first resurrection would include the prophets and all those that have believed in their words, and those who have died in ignorance without having salvation declared unto them and little children who died before they are accountable. This first resurrection of which Abinadi spoke is not to be confused with the first resurrection spoken of in the Doctrine and Covenants, which has reference to the coming forth from the grave of the faithful saints from the time of Christ to his time of his second coming. Those living in the millennium are also spoken of as coming forth in the first resurrection, for they too obtain an exaltation. Here's a little chart that kind of shows what Abinadi was preaching. The resurrection of celestial people. That's Christ's resurrection. And then there is the beginning of the millennium. And so that's also the resurrection of the righteous. But also resurrection of terrestrial people come at the beginning of the millennium and throughout the millennium. It's at the end of the millennium that the, you get the, the resurrection of celestial people. And then at the end of that, you get the resurrection of sons of prediction who will then be thrust down to hell with Satan and his angels for eternity. So hopefully that little chart helps you with the resurrections he's referring to. Chapter 15, verse 26, For the Lord shall redeem none such that rebel against him and die in their sins. Elder Joseph B. Wordling gave the following counsel that would keep us from rebellion against Christ. He said, quote, In conclusion, let me offer this advice and promise. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Partake of the sacrament worthily. Always remember our Lord and Savior. Never defame his sacred name. Do not ridicule the sacredness of the holy priesthood and the ordinance of the gospel. If you honor this counsel, the spirit of rebellion will never come into your hearts. End of quote. There's how we keep rebellion out. May we be wise enough to follow his advice and counsel. Chapter 15, verse 26, have no f part in the first resurrection, means such persons are those which receive not the gospel, neither the testimony of Jesus, those who are liars and sorcerers, adulterers and whoremongers, those whosoever loves and makes a lie, they who suffer the wrath of God on earth when the Savior returns in glory, they who suffer the vengeance of eternal Father when the wicked are consumed as stubble, those who are cast down to hell at the time of their death, who suffer the wrath of the Almighty God until the fullness of times, meaning until the end of the millennium, when Christ shall have subdued all enemies under his feet and have perfected his work. These are they who receive bought these are 
These are they whose bodies are telestial, they who shall not be redeemed from the devil until the last resurrection, until the Lord, even the Christ the Lamb, shall have finished his work. Chapter 15, verse 27, Salvation cometh to none such. Joseph Smith taught, Salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it but himself or one like him. Salvation is eternal life. It is life in the highest heaven, life among the gods and the angels. The word salvation means exactly the same thing as eternal life, but simply lays stress upon one saved condition, his state being one of deliverance from death and sin through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Exaltation is another word with which we have come to identify the glories of the celestial kingdom. Exaltation has the same meaning as eternal life. It has the same meaning as salvation. To be saved is to be exalted. The later term simply lays stress upon the elevated and ennobling status of one who so qualifies to dwell with and be part of the church of the firstborn, the church of the exalted. Chapter 15, verses 28 through 31, having explained earlier how it is that the servants of the Lord, even the Lord himself, published the message of the gospel, peace, Abinadi now quotes from what we know as Isaiah 52, 8 through 10, having spoken at length concerning the condescension of the Holy One, having discoursed masterfully upon the ministry of Christ and the salvation available through his redeeming blood, and having looked forward to the time when all men and women will be resurrected and judged according to their merits and labors on earth, Abinadi now rejoices in the coming glory of the millennium, that era of consummate peace when Christ will have won the victory and when the old serpent, even Satan, will have been bound and consigned to the bottomless pit for a thousand years. I'm sorry, I forgot years on that. So that's what the scripture means. And then he will publish peace. That's why he taught the mission of Christ, all that Christ would do, and repentance on his name. And then, if you will respond to that, then his gospel is a gospel of peace. The reason why he couldn't preach that to these people is because they were not living the gospel. And so he had to preach a gospel of doom, a gospel of destruction, of bondage, because of their wickedness. Let's now go to Messiah chapter 16. 16 verse 1, the phrase, all shall see the salvation of the Lord, rent. When the children of Israel saw the Pharaoh and the armies of Egypt were pursuing them, they complained bitterly to Moses, supposing they would be destroyed. Fear not, Moses responded, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show, show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you see today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Moses then parted the Red Sea that Israel might walk through it on dry ground, while the mighty army of the Egyptians was drowned in its waters. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day, and established a pattern for all future generations. The salvation of Israel, her deliverance from all enemies, reside with God, and that deliverance must come in such a manner that none can doubt that God did it. Indeed, Israel has no redemption, save it comes at his hand. So, too, we need to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and put our trust in Him. Describing the journey, the joyous day of Israel's triumph, ultimate triumph, Isaiah wrote, Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted His people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This is but to say, Israel, your redemption rests with the Lord. He alone can save you by his power, and none other will you be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. It is for him to restore you to the position of power and glory enjoyed in David's day. And all the world shall see it and acknowledge that the God of heaven hath done it. All shall see the victory rest with the Lord Jehovah. Won't that be a glorious day when we finally have gathered all of Israel? What a miracle that will be. Chapter 16, verse 1, the phrase, Every people shall see eye to eye. For people to see eye to eye is for them to be united. It is an idiomatic expression similar to the meaning to our being of one mind. In the millennial day, those of every nation, kindred, and tongue will feel compelled to acknowledge the power of God, Israel's God. 
Yea, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess before him. Yea, even at that day, when all men shall stand to be judged of him, then shall they confess that he is God. Then shall they confess, who live without God in the world, that the judgments of an everlasting punishment is just upon them. And they shall quake and tremble, and shrink beneath the glance of his all-searching eye. Chapter 16, verse 2, the phrase, the Lord redeemeth them not, meant redemption should not be confused with resurrection. The Book of Mormon Prophets make it plain that the resurrection is universal, it's unconditional, that all who are born in mortality will come forth in a resurrected state, having a body and spirit in inseparably united because of Christ's resurrection. In the full and complete sense of the word, however, not all are redeemed. Be it remembered that Lehi taught that redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Alma testified that Christ cometh to redeem those who will be baptized unto repentance through faith on his name. Nephi, son of Helaman, explained that through the Lord surely should come to redeem his people. He should not come to redeem them in their sins, but to redeem them from their sins. And he hath power given him from the Father to redeem them from their sins because of repentance. Therefore he has sent his angels to declare the tidings of the conditions of repentance, which bringeth unto the power of the Redeemer unto the salvation of their souls. Thus, through the atonement of Christ brings a general redemption to all, that is, the resurrection, only those who so live as to return to the presence of the Father have been fully redeemed in the high spiritual sense. So you, we can be fully redeemed and go to the celestial kingdom, or we can be partially redeemed and go to either the terrestrial or the telestial kingdoms. They are, still re, they are still glories of redemption, but do not have a fullness of glory of redemption, as the exaltation does in the celestial kingdom. Chapter 16, verse 3, the, the phrase, the devil has power over them. The devil has power over the flesh through the fall of Adam, and for that matter, all of his posterity became subject to the will of the devil. For Satan is the god of this world. Thereafter, they were left to choose, to either submit to the god of a fallen world or to rebel against Lucifer and serve instead the father of their spirits. To love Satan more than God, earth more than heaven, the temporal more than the eternal, the flesh more than the spirit, this is to be seduced by and become acclimated to the world where darkness reigns. 16 verse 4, the phrase, thus all mankind were lost, meant, here in a single sentence, Benedi capsulizes the doctrine of salvation by grace. Adam fell, and thus all of his posterity are subject to the effects of the fall. All inherit a fallen nature, meaning the natural man. None can deliver themselves from this fallen state. Their redemption requires the redeeming grace of an infinite being. Only God could accomplish such a labor, and thus none can be saved except it be through the redeeming grace grace of Jesus Christ. Chapter 16, verse 5, the phrase, he that persisteth in his own carnal nature. The apostle Paul said it best, quote, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walketh not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they who are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are after the flesh cannot please God, but are but ye are not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, if it so be the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. End of quote from Joseph Smith translation, Romans 8, 1 through 9. Brothers and sisters, we need to pay more spirit to, we need to pay more attention to our spiritual selves than our temporal selves, so that we can become redeemed in Christ. Because of our fallen nature, we have to be spiritually minded. And that can only come through Christ and the Holy Ghost.
The phrase in verse 5 of being an enemy to God meant, for the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth to inflict upon him. I think we forget that phrase in this. God will inflict certain things upon us that he knows that are for our good. Can we submit to them? Even as a child does submit to his father. So we as natural men will always be an enemy to God and can only put it off through the atonement of Christ. Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 16, verse 8, the phrase, The sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. Joseph Smith said it perfectly. Salvation is nothing more nor less than to triumph over all our enemies and put them under our feet. And when we have put power to put all enemies under our feet in this world and a knowledge to triumph over all evil spirits in the world to come, then we are saved, as in the case of Jesus, who was to reign until he had put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy was death. Chapter 16, verse 9, the phrase, He is the light and the life of the world. Light brings freedom, deliverance, and hope. It is a symbol of happiness, pros prosperity, and joy. To the Jews, Christ declared himself to be the light of the world. To those of the latter days, he announced himself to be the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. Even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Without Christ, all is darkness, misery, and death. Chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. To this ancient testament, we add the words of a modern prophet, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, quote, In his love and in his mercy, a gracious God seeks the salvation of all his children, but he cannot save the righteous without damning the wicked. He cannot reward the obedient without condemning the rebellious. He cannot fill the hearts of the righteous without unmeasured blessings without pouring out his wrath upon the wicked. Indeed, how could a just and holy being who cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance do other than send wrath and vengeance upon those who worship Satan and rebel against him? Chapter 16, verses 14 through 15, the phrase, if you teach the law of Moses, also teach that it is a shadow of those things which are to come. Teach them that redemption cometh through Christ the Lord. As Abinadite concludes his testimony to the priest of King Noah, having taught such glorious doctrines as the condescension of God, the ministry of Christ as Father and Son, the reality of the resurrection and the doctrine of redemption from the fall, he now attests that these matters, which all doctrines of salvation, center in the person and powers of Jesus Christ. No saving doctrine, the law of Moses included, and you could say even the law of the gospel, can be properly taught or understood independent of the testimony of the Lord of life. It matters not how well the farmer cultivates, nourishes, and tends his field if he has forgotten to plant his seed. So we must plant the seed of Christ in our hearts. Let's finish up with now Mosiah chapter 17. 17 verses 1 through 4. Alma he believed on the words of Abinadi. It is with painful but striking irony that before Abinadi faces the flames of a mitre's fire, his prophetic witness kindles the fire of testimony within the heart of another. Conversion is always a miraculous matter, particularly in the midst of gross wickedness among a people who are smitten with heart hardness as a result of their iniquity. But the Spirit of the Lord is mighty to save, is quick and powerful, sharper than a two edged sword, to the dividing the center of both joint and marrow. The spoken word, sustained by the power of the Spirit, cuts deep into the human soul and leads to faith and courage on one hand and to anger, bitterness, and fear on the other. One wonders why it was that Alma was touched by the testimony of Abinadi when none of his fellow high priests seemed to have been similarly affected. Was Alma troubled by the pangs of conscience even before Abinadi came on the scene? Did Alma's sense of right and wrong, his inner sense of justice, cry out against the abominations of the court of King Noah? We do not know. Perhaps his situation was none like that of Saul of Tarsus. Saul, it would appear, had begun to wonder whether he was doing what he was doing was right or not. Perhaps the shining face of the dying Stephen and the martyr's last prayer began to seek deep, more deeply into his soul than it had done before. Perhaps he wondered whether the works of the Lord, if he were really engaged in it, would make him feel so restless and bitter. 
He was soon to learn that only the works of the evil one produce those feelings, and that true service for the Lord always brings peace and contentment. Could it have been otherwise than that both Saul and Alma, who courageously wielded the swords of truth in an estate now forgotten, experienced a sense of recognition, a remembrance of truth, and feelings, a reminiscence of things once unknown? Or things once known? Chapter 17, verses 6 through 20, the example of Abinadi. Elder Robert D. Hills and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles emphasized the need to follow the example of Abinadi's courage in keeping the commandments. Quote, what a powerful example Abinadi should be to all of us. He courageously obeyed the Lord's commandments, even though it cost him his life. Prophets of all dispensations have willingly put their lives on the line and with courage have done the will and proclaimed the word of God. The prophet Joseph Smith went like a lamb to the slaughter, never wavering as he fulfilled the Lord's commandments. And think of our Savior's example. He endured to the end, fulfilling his divine mission and completing the atoning sacrifice for all mankind. Let us follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and his prophets, past and present. It may not be required of us to give our lives as martyrs, as did many of the prophets. What is required is our obedience to the Lord's commandments and our faithfulness to the covenants we have made with him. End of quote. It has once been said that you might be willing to die for Christ, but it's better, are you willing to live for Christ? Are we brothers and sisters? That will be seen in our actions and our desires. Having delivered his majestic messianic prophecy and called the wicked to repentance, Abinadi, like his prophetic partner Stephen, submitted to a cruel death at the hands of cruel men. It is not easy to die, even to die for one's testimony, but the taste of, this is, taste of death is so much sweeter to those whose lives and words bear fervent witness of him whose servants they are. Frequently, the Lord requires certain of his representatives to shed their own blood in a martyr's death, that their testimony might be in full force. Certainly, that was required of Christ, Abinadi, and even Joseph Smith. And so the testator was dead, but the testimony lives on, and faith has come to one by hearing the word of God as preached by a legal administrator. As recorded by Mormon, some time during Abinadi's sermon, a heart was touched and a witness planted as to the truthfulness of his words. A young man believed the words which Abinadi had spoken, and because of the power of the word, the power of a single human testimony, the course of events in Nephite's story would never be the same. And so we see it even happening, continuing the same pattern today. A single testimony given to one person can cause many to come into this church. 17 verse 11, now King Noah was about to release him for the fear of his words. Why is that? Paul Y. Hoskinson a professor at BYU of ancient scripture, in the said, In the trial of Abinadi, why does King Noah become afraid that the judgments of God would come upon him? When Abinadi had already been convicted of a capital crime by Noah's court. One reason may be that Noah's court, corrupt as it was, still operated under the guise of ancient Near Eastern law. One aspect of this legal system, meaning trial by ordeal, may explain Noah's behavior. If a case came down to one person's word against another's, the case could not be dismissed but had to be resolved through the trial of ordeal. The accused person, by winning the ordeal, was proven innocent, and the accuser would become guilty of bearing false witness and would suffer the punishment for the crime he falsely charged. Abinadi had been accused of a capital crime, so he proposed such a trial. They could put him to death, but he would not take back his words. By dying without recanting, Abinadi would win the trial by ordeal and thus prove that he was telling the truth. At this point, Noah refused the trial by ordeal and would Noah refused the trial by ordeal and would have released Abinadi had it not been for the priest's words, he has reviled the king, a treasonable offense which stirred the king's anger. Instead, the king delivered him up to be slain, and Abinadi was tortured with scourging and was killed by fire without taking back his words. In the process of winning the trial by ordeal, Abinadi could prophesy that Noah and the other accusers would therefore suffer as he did, death by fire. So they, because they were guilty by trial by ordeal, had to suffer the same death that they accused him of. 
And that will come to pass as we will see in the Book of Mormon. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this has helped with these chapters and helped you with the doctrine and Christ and pointing to Christ and coming unto Christ. May we re always remember everything is about Christ. We must come unto him and his grace, for it is only by his grace that we are saved. If this helps you, please hit the like button.